capitalism with respect to values is that I don't yet know what to say. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers both for their invitation and for all the enormous amount of hard work that must have gone into putting this show together. Um, however, I have a confession to make. When I first received the invitation, I really wasn't sure whether I should laugh or cry. Um, why was that? Well, because my work on realism, or rather on realism, dates at least from the 1980s. That's the first reason. Um, the second is it calls on ideas from Peirce, who in turn calls on Duns Scotus. So its claim to be new is, well, um, I don't know what to say. Um, the most recent parts of it are new, but like most of my work, this looks like a partially completed crossword puzzle. I'm still working at it. I'm still nibbling at corners of the crossword. Um, in the 1980s, I was making preliminary distinctions, um, and I confess I was motivated in part by the fact that I had the office next door to the last living hardline Popperian philosopher. Um, and I felt some admiration for Popper's intention, his aspiration, to combine fallibilism and objectivity. And at the same time, I thought that his execution of this was catastrophically bad. Um, that's to say that the fallibilism shortly collapsed into a kind of skepticism. Um, and that the three worlds theory um, explained nothing. Uh, okay. At the same time, I was exploring varieties of realism as contrasted with nominalism. In the 1990s, I started exploring Peirce's critique of nominalism, which he believed undermined science. And I came to believe he was right about this. Nominalism really is incompatible with the demands of modern science. And its consequences for contemporary philosophy of science, I think, have been very bad. Um, I was also exploring Peirce's own very, very unusual form of realism, and I was developing my own modestly realist position. Uh, the first published statement of the theory I call innocent realism was in 1996. And what I had in mind then and still had in mind now is that this theory is innocent, for example, of unnecessary epistemological accretions. Um, but at the same time, I hope it's not naive. So not guilty, but not naive either. Um, I refined and amplified this in a paper in 2002, which I confess until I received this invitation, I wasn't sure anybody ever read. Uh, and in 2003, I began to apply this theory first to the natural sciences and then to the social sciences. And in 2007, prompted by a Uruguayan commentator who actually had read it, um, I carefully distinguished it from what Putnam calls metaphysical realism. Well, here were the ideas that were very gradually gelling. The first was that the word realism has multiple meanings. Um, I wish I'd invented this word, but it wasn't I. It was a student of mine who invented the word very ambiguous for a word that's worse than ambiguous. It doesn't have two meanings, it has multiple meanings. Realism is, is very ambiguous. It contrasts with a whole host of different terms, and some of those other terms, like relativism, are even more ambiguous than realism is. Um, so what we need to do, I concluded, was to discriminate the defensible from the indefensible forms. Um, what I take it all forms of realism have in common is that they all say that something is independent in some sense of something human. What differentiates them is what it is that's said to be independent of what and in what sense. Um, so, for example, we have realism versus nominalism, um, which I take to be competing views about the reality of kinds and laws. Realism as opposed to various forms of idealism. Realism as opposed to various forms of verificationism. 
And when I came in, um, I don't mean when I came into this room, when I came into this debate in Britain in the 1980s, that meant Davidson versus Dummett. So that many times in the 1980s, I would go to various British universities, I would deliver papers, and someone would inevitably ask, are you a realist or an anti-realist? Meaning, are you with Davidson or with Dummett? It took me a couple of years to work out the correct answer. No, I'm not a realist or an anti-realist, if that's what it means. And then, of course, there's realism versus various forms of relativism. And perceptual realism versus phenomenalism and various forms of scientific realism versus instrumentalism and later constructive empiricism and so on. And metaphysical realism versus conceptual relativity in various time slices of Putnam. As for relativism, oh my God, in 1996 I distinguish umpteen forms of relativism differing in what said to be relative to what and in what sense of relative. So I started with a distinction between anthropological relativism and philosophical relativism. Anthropological relativism saying X, for example, moral or epistemic values, varies depending on Y, where Y is a culture or a paradigm or something. And philosophical relativism X makes sense only relative to Y. Um, I was, of course, mainly interested in the latter, but very concerned to point out that the latter does not follow from the former. Um, I distinguished many forms, unfortunately too many to get on one slide, um, but the, the, the two components were meaning, reference, truth, metaphysical commitment, ontology, reality, epistemic values, moral values, aesthetic values. Um, there were dot, dot, dots in my original table. And then is relative to what? Well, to language, to conceptual scheme, to theory, to scientific paradigm, to version or depiction, to culture or community, to individual dot, dot, dot. Um, I don't mean, of course, to suggest that every permutation of something from the left and something from the right identifies a, vio, I mean, a, a, a form of relativism that even makes sense, that we can even understand. But I think this table enables us to distinguish, for example, um, Quine's thesis of ontological relativity from Putnam's of conceptual relativity, from the linguistic idealism of Nelson Goodman. Um, and it enables us to identify what the thesis is that Kuhn, for example, is offering that's sometimes described as a form of epistemic relativism, um, which incidentally I believe is a kind of epistemological illusion, um, an illusion created by the fact that, okay, relevance of evidence is, in my view, material. That's to say, it depends on facts about the world. It's not a merely formal concept. And therefore, if you have different views, different beliefs about the world, you may have different beliefs about what evidence is relevant to what. And I think what Kuhn noticed was that if you adopted one paradigm, you might take a different view of what evidence was relevant to this claim. But this is not an argument for a form of epistemic relativism. It's an argument for the relativity of judgments of relevance, not of relevance to background beliefs. Okay, the core of innocent realism is metaphysical, though as you'll see, it spreads out into philosophy, science, epistemology, all kinds of places. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about the character of metaphysics, and this is my conclusion. Um, first of all, that what's sometimes claimed to be the illegitimacy of metaphysics is itself an illusion created by the many misconceived questions in which metaphysics has historically mired itself. Um, so it looks like an illegitimate en enterprise because it's got itself caught up with bad questions, that's to say questions with false presuppositions. Um, and I think, um, and now I'm fighting against my upbringing, I'm fighting Peter Strawson, for example, 
um, that the subject matter of metaphysics is not language and it's not our conceptual schemes, it's the world. Um, it is, of course, a consequence of this that metaphysics depends on experience. Um, that may sound very surprising. Um, but what I have in mind is not that metaphysics depends, like the sciences, on recherche experience that you can only obtain with the use of special instruments, for example, or expeditions or exhumations or whatever. But rather it depends on close attention to the familiar everyday kind of experience that we normally pay no attention to. Um, this is an idea well articulated by Peirce, um, who sometimes uses for what he's doing the word phenomenology, but more often uses a word which I really love, phaneroscopy. Um, mine is a sort of phaneroscopic metaphysics. Here are some innocent realist theses. There is one real world, which is largely but not wholly independent of us, our actions, our beliefs, and so on and is integrated, in a sense I'll try to explain, but very heterogeneous. Um, I will be using, as I hope you will notice, what I think of as the met method of successive approximation. I begin by saying something that strikes me as, this has to be true, um, but it's very vague. And then what I try to do is to make it more precise without making it false. No, not as easy as that sounds. Okay. And the thing that seems to me obviously true, but clearly not precise enough, is there is one real world. Um, this one real world includes, as Lewis Carroll would say, shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. Or as Quine would say, everything. Um, everything meaning at least these things. Natural objects, stuff, phenomena, kinds, and laws. Mental states and processes, thoughts, dreams, and so on. Social institutions, roles, and rules. Human and some animal artifacts. Scientific and other theories. Works of fiction, imagined beasts, people, and places. Probably more, but that's the beginnings of my list. So this one real world of innocent realism, I'm going to try to illustrate it for you. This is a little, a little crazy, but okay. There was, there was the universe, now here is, is the earth, and here are rocks and animals and DNA. Now it might look as if I'm going in a reductionist direction. Um, I'm not. Because I also see as part of this run real world tools, um, roads, all these human artifacts, um, social artifacts. I don't know how well that comes out. Um, whoops, what happened? What's up there is not the same as what's here. Eek. Okay. Tools, all human artifacts, in fact. Um, that picture looks very faint, the one on the right, but it's a money tree. So social institutions like money, and then other social institutions like religions and um, works made by human beings from the sciences, that's the origin of species on the one side, to works of fiction, uh, middle marches on the other. Uh, so this is a pluralistic universe. I'm deliberately borrowing James's quasi-oxymoronic phrase a pluralistic universe. There is one real world, but boy, is it heterogeneous. And the problem is to understand how all the parts fit together. All right, now what's the significance of one, one real world? Though it's very diverse, the world is integrated. What does integrated mean? Well, in part, that our artifacts are constrained by the physical properties of stuff you can't, for example, make a typewriter out of just feathers. Right? And you can't, well, I actually once wrote, you can't make a pillow out of rock. And then shortly after I'd published this sentence and it was irretrievable, um, I was in Oslo and they took me to see the Kontiki exhibit. And there was a pillow made out of stone. 
Okay, well, all right, but you see what I mean. Um, you can't make a typewriter out of butter either. Okay. Our beliefs, I believe, are physically realized, and so on. So, um, I now return to the original um, unease with Popper. Um, I don't mind talking about the three aspects of the world, if, if he wants to talk that way. But to talk of three worlds as if they were three distinct worlds seems to me to, to involve a cost without any gain. Uh, and I'm not willing to talk about possible worlds unless this is construed as ways the real world might have been. And, of course, I have no time for the linguistic idealism of people like Nelson Goodman, who apparently thinks that we brought the Big Dipper or the Pacific Ocean into being by naming them. What I want to say to, to, to Goodman is that those stars and that body of water were there before there were people and will be there long after we're gone. There it is, looking very Pacific. And what does real mean? Okay, now here, like Peirce, I think Dun Scotus got something important right. Um, I am, I might say, relying on what Peirce tells me about Scotus, and if someone wants to correct me and tell me Peirce has misunderstood him, then perhaps this view doesn't go quite as far back as I thought. Um, what does real mean? Not independent of us. That would rule out real human artifacts, and there certainly are real human artifacts. I am using several of them at the moment. Um, nor does it mean mind independent, because that would rule out real thoughts, real dreams. And there really are thoughts, there really are dreams. Um, and there are objective truths about what it is that I dreamt. Um, God knows what, what Freudian thing I'm telling you, but I will give you an example. When I was small, I used regularly to dream that I was being chased up and down the stairs of my uncle's house by a horse. Go figure. Um, but it's tr objectively true that my dream was about my uncle's house and not my house, and that I was being chased by a horse and not a unicorn. Okay. So what I think real means, and what, according to Peirce, Scotus thought real means, is, is how it is independently of what you or I or anyone thinks about it. Peirce himself wants to go on and give another twist to this definition. I don't, because I think that takes him in an idealist direction. So what real contrasts with is fiction, figment, imaginary since what properties an imaginary beast or a fictional character has depends on what properties its creator or its creators give it. Um, this needs kind of careful handling. Here's my view about fiction. There are real works of fiction and real fictional characters. But these real fictional characters are not real people or real rabbits, or real hobbits, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then there's a little bit in square brackets, and square, square brackets for me means, psst, by the way. Um, by the way, I've actually come to believe that fictionality is a matter of degree. If you press me, I will tell you why, but that is a whole other story. Uh, okay, so that's the core of innocent realism. Now let me explain how I've applied it, at least, in philosophy of science. I believe, as Peirce did, that for explanation or for prediction to be possible, there must be real kinds and laws. Um, Peirce has a piece of theatrical business which is really quite convincing about this. He apparently comes into a lecture. He has a rock in his briefcase. I don't have one, sorry. And he asks his audience, um, do you know what would happen if I were to let go of this? Do you know what would happen if I were to let go of this? Sure you do. Well, he says, you're all scholastic realists. What he means is, if you believe, as I'm sure you do believe, if I were to let go of it, it would fall, then you must believe 
that there are real kinds, to which, like stones to, or watches, to which this belongs, and real natural laws. Um, but these real kinds and laws, I believe, are not well conceived as abstract individuals. That's the sort of nominalistic Platonist mistake. Nor do I think of natural kind terms as rigid designators. Um, so for me to say, for example, that horses or DNA constitute a real kind is to say that horses or DNA behaves alike independently of what we believe about them. Uh, and I think natural kind terms have meanings. And moreover, the meaning change in the sciences, which for many, many years was thought of as an impediment to rationality, can actually be a, a contribution to rationality. And that you can watch in the sciences as they devise natural kind terms which correspond more and more closely to real kinds of things. Um, I've studied this, for example, with respect to the history of the concept of DNA, uh, which took about a hundred years to take its present form. Okay. I, I also believe that scientific theories are normally either true or else false, and that the goal of science is true answers to its questions. But at the same time, that all scientific theories are fallible and that there is absolutely no guarantee that at each step the sciences make progress. Uh, what do I mean by the goal is true answers? Something very modest indeed. Modest and I guess it's kind of Ramsey-esque. I think of it as laconicist. A scientist investigating whether P, whatever P happens to be, wants to end up believing that P, if P, and believing that not P, if not P. That's what it means to want true answers. And of course, if it's more complicated than that, he wants to end up believing that it's more complicated than that. Sometimes it is a lot more complicated than that. P or not P doesn't cover the options. As I conceive them, kinds and laws include not only natural kinds, like creatures' stuff, not only natural laws, but also artifactual kinds, like chair and lamp, and social kinds, like money or marriage or law. Now, this is why the social sciences are possible. Uh, now, social institutions, roles and rules depend in part on what people in the society concerned believe about them. For example, whether a currency is viable depends on whether most people in the society concerned believe that it's viable. If enough people lose faith in it, it will lose its value and become non-viable. Uh, and then we'll be in Zimbabwe using the Zimbabwean dollars to light the fire on the grounds the fire is more valuable than the dollars are. But even though social institutions, roles and rules depend in part on what people in the society concerned believe about them, they are nevertheless real in the sense I've explained. That's to say they're independent of what you or I or any individual believes about them. Um, this has to be right because Professor Searle and I came up with the same example independently. Um, you and I cannot make the funny money we print in the basement real money by believing that it is. We can believe it as hard as we like. It still isn't really money. Um, I think some social phenomena, some human social phenomena are universal. For example, hierarchy, mating, religious practices of one kind and another, envy and fear of envy. And others are local, only some societies have them, like witch doctors, marching bands, banks, churches, armies. Not every society has these. Uh, and of course much, though not all, of the social sciences is intentional, by which I mean in explaining what people do, it refers to people's beliefs and hopes and fears. 
I believe that such mental states are physiologically realized, but they are not explicable in purely physiological terms. Um, that may sound mysterious. I hope it isn't. I think it's actually less mysterious than reductionism. But okay. Briefly and very, very roughly, what I want to say is this. It's all physical. There are no spooks. There aren't souls. There's nothing supernatural. But it's not all physics. So my position is physicalist, but it's not reductionist. And what that amounts to, this is a very long story, which I can tell only in a very brief form, is that to understand ascriptions of belief, for example, um, and it's beliefs with which I feel most comfortable because epistemology is my central thing. Um, understanding ascriptions of belief and such cannot be done purely in terms of the physiology of the brain, but must go through a socio-historical cultural loop relating um, the words that, in the language that the person concerned speaks to things in the world and to the use of those words in his society. Okay. Um, actually, I say words, but um, any kind of sign would do. Um, it doesn't have to be words, but it's just more convenient to talk that way. Um, the inspiration for this theory was George Herbert Mead, who I think is the most important philosopher of mind ignored by contemporary philosophers of mind. True, he writes like a constipated camel. You know, he writes very badly, but he thinks very deeply, I believe. Um, I'm delighted to find a recent book, which I'm now halfway through, chuckling with delight all the way, arriving at the very same conclusion. This is a book by Raymond Tallis called Aping Mankind. Um, and interestingly enough, he is a neuroscientist and wherever I have said, look, you can tell me in absolutely complete detail about what the cogs and wheels are in the brain. Doesn't matter. It still won't explain what it is to believe that the ice is thick enough to walk on. No, no physiological description will do that. Um, well, because he's a neuroscientist, he actually knows what the cogs and wheels look like and describes them in great detail and reaches the same conclusion. This will not by itself explain beliefs, hopes, fears. Um, this is the only bit that's really, really new. This is a relatively recent exercise of mine. And that is, what does innocent realism tell us about the law and legal institutions and such? Here things get verbally really quite awkward. Because in legal philosophy, words like realism and positivism have significantly different meanings than they have in, what shall I call it, in central philosophy. Um, so that a legal positivist is someone who believes that what the law is, is whatever the sovereign says it is. So basically it's what's in the statute books. And legal realism is not opposed to, I don't know how else to do this, it's not opposed to legal idealism, it's opposed to legal idealism. That's to say to the idea that there's something to law beyond the human institutions and the things that human beings do and the statutes that human beings make and the interpretations that human judges give to those. Okay. Um, I didn't think until yesterday afternoon that I was a legal realist. I think I still don't think I'm a legal realist. Um, legal realism, at least in the US sense, conveys a strong connotation of cynicism about the law. Um, in its crudest form, it's sometimes described to students as, well, you know, this is the idea that what the law is depends on what the judge had for breakfast, or whether the judge had a fight with his wife before he came to court. 
Okay, well, if that's legal realism, I'm not a legal realist. But I do believe, I think I'm a legal pragmatist, but anyway. The verbal, the verbal awkwardness aside, here is my take. Legal institutions, roles, and rules are a subclass of social institutions. In particular, laws are a subclass of social norms, um, different from ethical norms, different from norms of etiquette, but another subclass of social norm. Um, so what you see me trying to do is to fit my understanding of a legal system into my understanding of the social sciences more generally. So social institutions, roles and rules are what social sciences are about. Those institutions are of many kinds and they include some which are normative. Rules, of course, are normative. Um, and among those are legal norms. Okay. Um, now I need to make a distinction between law, the phenomenon, and legal systems. Law, the phenomenon, is a kind of social institution found in many but not all societies, um, a way of imposing certain rules of behavior on people. The law, that's to say, a particular legal system cannot be understood except as relative to a place and a time. Um, it makes no sense to ask, if you're not asking about the phenomenon, what is the law about rape? Well, there's no answer. Um, if you want to know what is the law about rape in Florida in 1976, I can tell you something. If you want to know what is the law about rape in Pakistan in 2006, I can tell you. Why did that example come to mind? I know why. Um, because in Pakistan in 2006, though I understand no longer, one very curious feature of the law about rape was that in order to prove a charge of rape, you required four male Muslim eyewitnesses, which meant, in effect, that you could not prove such a charge. This is the kind of thing you read in the newspaper and, and you can't forget it. You just cannot forget it because it's so, so striking to a Western ear. What, what are they thinking? Um, okay. So what the law is, is relative to a jurisdiction and to a time. Okay. Though the law is a general social phenomenon, what the law is, is a question about Massachusetts in such and such a date, or Florida in such and such a date, or... England in such and such a date, or Germany today, or etc. This doesn't imply um, any kind of relativism with respect to truth. Okay, so maybe I want to go back a bit. Forgive me. I barely have time, but I think I do have time. I want to go back just a little bit. When I distinguished umpity ump forms of relativism um, in 1996, um, okay, I think I will tell you the story. Every philosophy department of which I have ever been a member has included another member whose main thing was being against relativism. Okay. Um, just one, but there has always been one such person in any department of which I was a member. And I was prompted to write this piece about relativism by a graduate student who snuck into my office and whispered behind his hand, Dr. Hark, what is relativism? I know Dr. X is against it, but I don't know what it is. This is a great question. And I said, well, you know, it's the view that something is relative to something. And I started writing on the blackboard and ended up with the diagram that I showed you on two slides. Actually, that shows the superiority of blackboards when you think about it. Uh, and part of my point, then and now, is that not every form of relativism is false. And moreover, not every form is self-defeating. 
Some forms, I think, are true. Um, for instance, several anthropological forms, and more importantly for present purposes, uh, for example, uh, the idea that truth, the sentential truth, is relative to a language, which was a, a thesis that Tarski proposed. Yes, the truth of sentences is indeed understandable only relativized to some language or other. And that thesis is both true and in no way self-undermining. Uh, whether you think truth is primarily a, a property of sentences, that's a different question from the question about relativism. So part of my point was, not every form of relativism is false. Okay. And it's true, if this is a form of relativism, that it makes sense to say what the law is only relative to a time and a jurisdiction. Okay. But it doesn't follow from this that the, the truth is relative to a time or a jurisdiction. And this means that I have to take you into a whole other area of my thinking, that's to say my thinking about truth. Uh, okay, I've made the same kind of distinction more than once. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't start, I shouldn't have started with law or truth. I should have started with something easier, like life. Okay, the word life, like most of these kinds of abstract nouns, has two meanings. Two uses, perhaps, would be better. In one use, it refers to the phenomenon of life. Um, it's in that usage that Schrodinger's book, What is Life, is using the term. That's the way What is Life uses the term. But when we speak of, say, the, life, the lives of the slaves on the cotton plantations as short and brutal, we're talking about particular instances of a general phenomenon. Similarly, when I talk about beauty, if I say, for example, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I don't think that, but if I did say that, I would be talking about the phenomenon, beauty. If I speak about the gorgeous gardenia in my front yard and say, that plant is a real beauty, I'm talking about a particular instance of the phenomenon. And I want to make the very same kind of distinction with respect to the word law, the phenomenon, and particular instances of the phenomenon, and truth, the phenomenon, the property, versus particular true propositions. So once we distinguish truth, the phenomenon, from truths, particular true propositions, we see that while some truths are relative, so that legal truths are normally relative to a time and a jurisdiction, truth is not relative, so that you can be the kind of legal pragmatist that I am, you can think that legal institutions are wholly made by human beings, right? that they're convention all the way down, if you like, but that nevertheless, no relativity about truth follows from this. So I want to keep, let me keep going. Laws are made by what people do. For example, by the writers of constitutions, by legislatures, by judges who interpret legal provisions. I don't mean that the law is whatever some judge says it is. What I mean by that is that what the law is, is the result of numerous, the accumulation of numerous, often very small, shifts of interpretation over time. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the present understanding of the Establishment Clause of the US Constitution, which says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Initially, what that meant is there shall be no national church, like the Church of England in England. Um, over a well, couple of hundred years, it's come to mean something quite different. That's to say that no government action should be such, as, such that an objective observer would take it to endorse, or whatever the, what's the opposite of endorse, dedorse, there is no such word, endorse or the opposite, um, any religion over other religions or religion over non-religion. 
And this has happened by a series of identif identifiable small modifications of the meanings of these words by the US Supreme Court. So, laws are made by what people do, but nevertheless, once they're made, they're real. I can find out what they are by legal research. And I guess the crook finds out what they are by breaking them and taking the consequences. Um, I want to stress that I'm not trying to, okay, I'm not a legal realist in the cynical sense. I'm a legal pragmatist, I think, which is what I take Holmes to be. Um, but I'm not identifying legal norms and moral norms. Not all moral norms are also legal norms, and not all legal norms are also moral norms. These are different things. And of course, some laws and some legal systems are morally better and some worse, and some are deplorable. Okay. Phew. Um, if I had more time, <gasps> I've, tried, okay, I've tried to give you the history of the theory, the way the theory grew, the metaphysical core of the theory, how it applies in philosophy of the natural sciences, how it applies in the philosophy of the social sciences, how it applies in particular to the law. If I had more time, I think I would want to say more about truth and more about the work that the distinction between truth, the phenomenon, and particular truths can do. It can, for example, explain why some truths are only partial, but truth doesn't decompose into degrees, sorry, into components. And some truths are vague, but truth is not a matter of degree. Um, those of you who know my work know I've had a sort of campaign against fuzzy logic going on for many years. Um, Dana Scott used to say, Dana Scott once gave a wonderful paper entitled Deviant Logic, Fact or Fiction, the thesis of which was, sorry, Fuzzy Logic, Fact or Fiction, the thesis of which was Fuzzy Logic wasn't fiction, it was pornography. Uh, I kind of agree. Okay. If I had more time, I'd talk more about truth, but I don't have more time, so, Dankeschön. <laughs>